Hello, this is uh, Jeffrey Fox again on the second lesson in the uh, unit describing data access patterns and what how they what they imply for the high performance computing enhanced Apache Big Data Stack. In this short, sh relatively short lesson, we discuss uh, some scientific uh, um, data access patterns. And uh, that's documented here. And we just go through a few examples. There are many like this, and some are actually a little different, but uh, you will see why we do the ones we do. So here we come back to actually access pattern five. We call it 5A because we add observational scientific data as the interactive analytics. And uh, let's just review what we have here and compare it. We have our basic uh, big data stack here, Hadoop, Spark, Giraffe, Pig. Here we add actually grid software, because that's often used in science still today. It's still very relevant for many scientific applications. We'll actually see why again when we look at some of the examples. Um, here we have Mahout and R still just uh, related to the previous world. But typically, most science has custom analysis code built for each field. Here we have the data storage. Now, very little science, if any, almost any, is actually analyzed with the Apache stack. So here, actually, file collection is probably the dominant scientific model. However, many of them could use the Apache stack and usefully use Apache and big data storage models. So what type of ways do we feed data in? That's sort of important. An important key idea. So we have direct transfer. That would be scientists studying, say, Twitter data, or maybe uh, data from the Internet of Things. That data might actually get uh, directly streamed into the data storage. That's actually pretty similar to the way it's done commercially. However, a lot of scientific data looks a little different. You have an experiment which gathers data. That could be an experiment to the North Pole, an experiment to a river. It could be a satellite. It could be a gene sequencer in some laboratory. <clears throat> and that data is in the field. That's the observational step. Data is gathered in, the, in the, wherever it's uh, given off. Now, what do you do with that data? Well, you do uh, two things. You actually often, and this is also true with commercial data, you do some initial computing. That initial computing is often done to reduce the volume of the data, or possibly just because you have more computers uh, locally than you do centrally. That's true in the particle physics case. So you do some initial computing, transforming the scientific data from taken in the field to um, a more refined form. In the data information knowledge wisdom pipeline, this could be called often the data to information step. That data is accumulated locally. Um, if this was data taken uh, in a uh, expedition to the North Pole, you might accumulate it for a month uh, from your uh, various uh, radar scans and seismic scans and things like that. They will be stored on tapes, and then those tapes would actually be sent back here to your main analysis system. So this is a batched data transfer. This data transfer occurs not in a direct streaming fashion, as we sort of see it said, uh, saw over here, but it's uh, done every every week, every month, or whatever is natural for the problem at hand. And then we look at some examples, the particle physics, Large Hadron Collider, uh, astronomy, bioinformatics, and remote sensing, uh, which is this uh, North and South Pole example where we're looking at what happens, uh, the data taken uh, from sc radar scans. All right, here we have the particle physics case. And we will actually look at that in the following unit in some more detail, because it's one of the examples we go through in detail. And here we'll just make some rather general remarks. 
The data is taken here at CERN. And this is one, one of the four um, major experiments, the so-called CMS experiment. They all actually look relatively similar. The experiments tend to detect everything with a whole set of various um, detectors. So the particles collide. Then, uh, then the results of those collisions are gathered. Uh, they actually uh, they go through some initial uh, stage uh, very near the ex uh, experimental apparatus to select the most interesting events. And then they're sent off to first CERN, which is the so-called tier zero center. And then they're sent all over the world. And this world is arranged in a hierarchical fashion. There are various big centers. This is the Rutherford Lab in England. Here is Fermilab in the USA. These are national centers. You actually have maybe one or two of these big centers in a given country or continent. Then these, are sent, then these national centers get farmed out to different um, tier two centers, which are typically university-based. And then we go to tier three centers, which are sort of labs of physicists and things like that. Um, notice the scale of this. There are sort of 2,500 of these things at tier, the tier three level. And uh, there are 40 countries, that's this level here, or possibly. And uh, we get tens of petabytes per year. Remember, I pointed out that um, even 100 petabytes is a very small fraction of the seven zettabytes that we gather uh, this year. Uh, Indiana University, where I, I'm from, it has uh, a role here at the tier two for one of, not the CMS experiment, but for the Atlas experiment. So, um, here we have these many petabytes per year. These are actually sort of a variant of the batch and local processing. They're just lots of computers around the world, which form the so-called grid of distributed systems. And most of the processing is done on those computers, around 300,000 cores in total. Uh, those computers break down the data, and the thing that actually gets sent for the final analysis and examination by the physicist is reduced in size. That actually tends to get replicated so it can be looked at by many different physicists. So this is a very, this is sort of consistent with that model, but different. And one of the reasons it's different is that this whole computing model was developed before clouds existed, started around probably 2000 in, in, in depth. And at that time, the best way to gather computers together appeared to be to take the world's computers and put them, view them as one. That's the grid concept. Whereas the cloud concept is different. It doesn't take the world's computers and view them as one. It puts all the, all the computers in one place or in a few places at the, at the large cloud data centers. So the next example where we have uh, some slides is astronomy. So astronomy, in particle physics, we looked at just one accelerator. There are actually other accelerators which are can be viewed similarly. But in astronomy, there are lots of uh, telescopes. Here is a particular telescope, or uh, the new one that went Chile for the so-called Dark Energy Survey. Now we have these telescopes gathering data around the world. Here's typical data from the uh, from the Dark Energy Survey. This this little area here is shown in detail here. So. What do we do? We take the data in Chile. Um, we ship that data to a site in the US. In the case here, I think it goes to largely Berkeley or um, uh, Illinois, NCSA at Illinois. And then it's actually processed there and stuck up on um, disks. And then it actually ends up as part of the so-called International Virtual Observatory, which is an international collection of data. Now, this is actually an important aspect of science data, which is a little different from sort of the politics or techni the way that data is gathered commercially. When you're on Facebook, you gather Facebook data. However, when you're an astronomer, or at least a, an, an analysis astronomer, you actually don't just look at your own data, you look at everybody's data. And that's the whole idea of the virtual observatory. Data is gathered by many people. 
That data is then looked at by either the same people or a different group of people who join data together, in the case of a, either from different telescopes or at different wavelengths, because each telescope or each wavelength then looks at the world in a very different fashion. So the, it's a critical point of multidisciplinary, or in this case, multi-wavelength science, that your data is almost inevitably distributed, it cannot be centralized. And so some of the assumptions underlying the big data stack don't quite work. These issues I don't think are very well understood. This um, plot here, or, or sorry, I should say slide here, shows a wrinkle here of, a, of this general idea. This is for the Hubble Space Telescope. Here we have typical results from Hubble, Hubble, beautiful structure here. And here's an illustration of what it's discovered at various depths into the past, uh, into the early universe. And you can now see uh, what happens. Here we have Hubble. Hubble goes to a satellite. Actually, gets goes up to a to a NASA satellite. That NASA satellite goes down to a ground station in White Sands, New Mexico, and then that goes uh, all over to the Hubble Space Telescope Institute, which is in Baltimore, Maryland. But it's actually a similar idea. Here the data is transported more in a streaming fashion, um, although it is probably often done in batch mode. Um, so this is, so you can see the way the data is staged into the analysis system it does depend somewhat on the size of the apparatus and the nature of the events. But in astronomy, it's reasonably similar to that streaming model. Now here's a rather different uh, one, which I'm associated with, with our so-called remote sensing, where we do radar surveys. This is to study the nature of uh, the ice sheets or glaciers in the North and South Pole or on uh, mountains like the Himalayas. Here, you, the, the, the brave scientists interested in this area, they go out on an expedition that lasts one or two months, and they might gather up to 100 terabytes of data. And most of that data, in, this, in our case, is stored on removable disks, and it is flown back to the continental US at the end of the experiment. Uh, note that one of the reasons you do this is the bandwidth. Here we show some sort of satellite receiving data, um, which is coming from the North Pole and going back to a so-called polar grid laboratory. That satellite does not have enough bandwidth to transmit the entire data sample. So you can only get samples this way. Um, this, if we look at this picture we have here, here, say so here's the processing in the in the USA at Indiana and Elizabeth City State. Here we have people at the North and South Pole. Here's a typical aircraft which flies with radar on it, and um, that t takes the, the the data which is actually uh, Process to make images, and those images are used to determine the depth of um, ice and snow and things like that. But here we do have a clear batching. Uh, we do not get the data from the experiment uh, in a streaming fashion as we do with those tweets and the astronomical data. We just get it every now and then at the end of an experiment. Here we have the last science example, which is yet a little different again. Here we don't have one giant apparatus, as we sort of had in some of the previous examples, astronomy, particle physics, and even the remote sensing, where really there was just one, one large apparatus, the radar um, recorder for each um, experiment. We have lots of devices sequencing genes. That comes from the drastic reduction in um, uh, cost of these devices. And this means that you can put gene sequences all over the place in different people's labs. They sort of cost, I think, around even now as little as $100,000.
Um, now, that means that you're getting this data streaming out in a distributed fashion across the world. Now, you're going to do some initial processing, probably locally, because uh, these machines produce so-called reads. The reads are the shown actually here. There's a these little uh, small strips, maybe I say 250 bases long, um, sometimes smaller, sometimes bigger. Uh, the bigger, the better, because that leads to uh, less ambiguity in the assembly. And then there's uh, an important uh, so-called assembly or alignment stage, which takes all these reads and decides how to put, stitch them together to make a complete genome. And that's um, the end of, um, that's how you get your gene sequence. Illumina is probably the dominant vendor in this field. It just announced actually their largest machine, the HiSeq X10, which uh, is ingeniously designed to get the to meet the goal of $1,000 per genome. It produces uh, almost a terra, uh, almost a 10 to the 12th basis every day. Here's a picture of it from the uh, company website. And so you can produce um, an awful lot of data with these machines. Now that data is, I say, typically processed locally, but in order to make progress, you actually have to, you typically want to compare it not only with other data taken with the same machine, but also with the world's other, rest of the world's data, because you're looking for differences. And comparing your gene with some, with the gene you just sequenced with the rest of the world's genes. That's done with uh, programs uh, which are very famous, like BLAST. That's a typical comparison program, uh, which itself runs in parallel, comparing gene se uh, sequences with a distributed database of existing sequences. Then at the end of all that, you'll get something. Well, here we showed some of our own work, which is so these are uh, prote pro proteomics, protein sequences, and here's clusters. Project, uh, shown here, projected into three dimensions so you can view them. It's just only a two-dimensional slice of a three-dimensional, um, two-dimensional projection of a three-dimensional uh, three dimensional representation of the data. So here is a little subtle, we actually again match, because you'll probably run multiple multiple sequences at the same time in every on every machine. But it's also distributed, namely your genes are being gathered all around the world. Again, it's not likely that possibly all the genes will end up at a big NIH center or a, or a European Bioinformatics Institute center. And so most of the genes might end up in one or two places so that you can do a good comparison, although those places typically don't have enough computing to do all the comparisons you need. So. Here we have a little challenge of, of deciding where to store the data, taking this distributed data, uh, process in a rather heterogeneous fashion and try to understand what to do. So this is a again a slightly different variant of the same idea of field data processed locally, done in batches, sent off to some sort of central site. So that's the end of our discussion of science. We will return to the other uh, general access patterns in the next uh, lesson.